Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this, the latest research launch from the CCMA, Navigating the AI Seascape. I am Stephen Yap, the Research Director at the CCMA. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me, whether you're dialing in live today or, or dialing in um, through the catch up. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, in about 20 minutes, we'll be joined by um, a, a very experienced panel uh, to discuss the, or a number of issues related to choosing and deploying AI technologies in the contact center. Um, and the folks that will be on the live panel with me today are actually folks that I talked to and interviewed as part of the research. And the report for the research is going to be launched this afternoon. If you're dialing in live, that's 27th of June. We're going to be making the report available as a free download to both CCMA members and non-members at ccma.org.uk. It is, I think, it is the longest report I've ever written. It, it, it's really long. Uh, it's about 9,300 words. Uh, you don't have to read it cover to cover. It's designed to be sort of, sort of chunked up so you can dip into bits and pieces. But I'm really pleased with the way it's turned out. And the reason why it's long is because it's such a big and rich and broad topic. There's so many different perspectives on AI. And we wanted to make sure that we gave it its due treatment in terms of, and, and, and um, really covered off on the many different perspectives in terms of where to start, where do you embark on the journey? How should you embark on the journey? And what are some of the things that you should keep in mind when um, on the voyage uh, of deploying AI within the contact center? Um, in the hour that we've got today, I want to make sure that we leave the majority of the time for the panel and also for your questions. So as we go through the course of the hour, do make use of the Q&A function. Um, you should be able to see that if you're dialing in uh, on Zoom on your desktop at the bottom, just to the right. So, do uh, type in any questions you have for our panel or for me, and we'll try our best to get to those questions. I am going to give you an overview, a very short overview of what's in the report and some of the key messages and talking points coming through from the report in just a second. But just to kick off, I'd like to ask you all a question. So let's tee up a, a poll question, because I'm really, really curious, and we've got quite a lot of people in the live webinar, so hopefully we should get a, an interesting range of responses. And I'm just really, really interested for those who are dialing in live, which of the following use cases, AI use cases, are you deploying or that you're considering deploying? So you see nine different choices here. You can select as many as um, apply to your organization. So select as many of the choices that you are considering or which you've already embarked on the voyage of deployment to. I'll just give you about 30 seconds to read through that list and tick the ones that apply to your organization, and then we'll share the results with everybody. So which of the following AI use cases are you deploying or considering deploying? Tick all of the ones that apply to you. Give you about 10 more seconds to make your choices. Five more seconds. Okay, poll is closed. Let's see the results. So the most selected option would be agent assist. That's really interesting. And then the next most common option would be to improve the chatbot, followed by writing aid, sentiment, identification, personalized interactions, Q&A. Okay, so there's a really broad mix of different use cases that everybody here dialed into the webinar is either looking at or is already embarked on deploying. That's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, and I think it's consistent with my understanding that there are so many different use cases and applications of AI within the contact center. Uh, we'll come back to that because this is a question um, that is very much dealt with at some length within uh, this particular research. So let me jump straight into my presentation. It's, it, it is really difficult to uh, to try to condense 9,300 words into about 15 minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, we talked to a number of different brands, as you can see here, and I conducted a series of in-depth interviews with some of the brands you can see here, um, all, all of whom are leaders in their field. And uh, I, would, I would say represented a number of different levels or stages of maturity when it comes to deploying AI. And in a moment, uh, we'll welcome Nick from Donnell. Um, and we'll welcome Dan from Simply Business, two of the folks that I talked with earlier, to the live panel to, to discuss this uh, live with us. So what I'm going to do now is basically take you through what's in the report. And I'm only going to be able to sh really skim the surface to sort of share with you some of the highlights of what's in the report. But I do encourage 
all of you, if you're interested in this topic, which you obviously are, because you're at dial into the webinar to download the free report, where there's really the depth and also the specific quotes and the the context from all of those brands and all the people that I talk to um, outlined in some depth and breadth. So before we get into specific use cases, what are the benefits of AI in the contact center? Well, AI is a productivity force multiplier. The reason why there is so much interest in hyper ad AI is because it may be the biggest step change in productivity that we've seen since at least the advent of the smartphone and maybe even since the start of the internet. Um, so much interest, so much, so much money is coming into the sector because of that reason alone. It, it promises to to really accelerate our productivity um, uh, more than anything we've seen in the last twenty years or so. Of course, personalizing contact experiences and particularly generative AI is an area that many of us are interested in, and. What AI is starting to deliver for those who have embarked on the voyage is, I think, nothing less than the Holy Grail. It's very, very seldom that something happens which both helps you to reduce cost, but also improve quality. Usually it's one or the other. But what AI can do and what I, AI is doing uh, for contact centers already is exactly that. And of course, contact centers are a huge repository for data within every organization. I think it's fair to say that contact centers handle more data and more data passes through the contact center than any other part of the organization. And most of that data, actually, no one ever does anything with it. But now through AI, the capability exists through predictive AI, through generative AI to actually extract value from that data that perhaps before was sitting there unused. And as an example of, um, I thought this was quite a nice quote, the, the report is, is filled with quotes and context from the brands and the people that I talk to. I call it the needle and haystack finder. So the haystack of data that sits within the contact center, AI can, is starting to help us find the needles. So the question that everybody asks, of course, is AI, is AI right for me? Is AI right for my organization? And here are some of the considerations that come into play when you think about how to answer that question. So what's really important to, to start by saying is that you've got to develop your own point of view. It's very easy to, to get caught up in the hype. It's very easy to caught up in the fear of missing out. Um, some of us may even actually have have organizations that are pushing or, or senior executive managers that are pushing us to go on the journey. But we must not lose sight of the best practice, which is always um, there is no one size of fit fits all. We must go on the journey. But part of going on that journey is assessing whether it's right or not. And the answer could be it's not right for me now, but it might be right for me later. The contact center actually is a really good place um, to experiment. In most organizations, the contact center serves as a horizontal function. Um, it serves many different departments. Therefore, the benefits benefits achieved in the contact center are felt across the organization. And generally, if it benefits customers, if it improves efficiency, not many people are going to argue with that. So if you're going to start with AI somewhere, it might as well be the contact center for a lot of organizations. Of course, think about your brand values. Not every organization has this, uh, aspires to the same level of customer experience. Not every organization or brand has the same type of customer profile. So start by thinking, what is the customer experience we want to deliver? And what is the level of ambition that we're achieve, uh, seeking to achieve? And then work backwards from that to think about how AI can support you. For some organizations, it's going to be a customer experience play. It's going to be a personalization and premiumization play. For other organizations, it may be more about the efficiency and the cost play. And of course, learn from peers. It can be extremely, extremely confusing uh, to, uh, when you're trying to embark on a marketplace that's full of so much information. There are so many vendors, there are so many technology partners vying for your attention. And because it's so new, we are all trying to surmount what is quite a steep learning curve. Of course, one of the best ways to, to surmount that learning curve is to hear from and learn from your peers, uh, others who have some experience on the voyage, which of course, um, this particular research is, is, is an example of. So the use cases in the contact center were uh, exactly the ones that actually um, you voted on in the poll. So enhancing the chatbot experience, the agent assist, which of course refers to an entire category of use cases, but may be described essentially as putting 
information in front of advisors in the moment in in the course of assisting a customer to help them assist the customer better writing aid is a really interesting one if we've ever used spell check if you've ever used a a, a grammatical aid then you've already used a, a, a an early form of ai already and the promise particularly as more and more contact interactions are handled through text is to actually use the ai to help the advisor write better Synthesize and summarize. So one um, bucket of use cases here would be to understand sentiment better, to understand intents better, and to understand the context of queries better. Another bucket would be to improve the management information that we're getting out of the contact. So to be able to extract value from data, to extract more value than we've been able to do in the past from the actual conversations that are coming through in the contact center, which can then help us to plan, which can help help us to understand what's driving demand, can help us to identify root causes to, to a much more uh, precise degree than was possible before. And of course, to identify customer characteristics. So if you're in a regulated sector, um, of course, with consumer duty on play, we all uh, you have an onus on supporting vulnerable customers. You have an onus to reporting back to the likes of the FCA and regulators on how you are um, identifying and supporting vulnerable customers. Um, and with AI embedded into things such as voice conversation analytics, um, the promise is to better identify vulnerability. But other characteristics can also be identified, such as customers who are at risk of churn, um, to then either route them or put in front of them the correct offers to help uh, convince them to stay. And many of you said that you're looking at QA. So one of the core promises of generative AI is faster, more accurate QA, although, of course, that it does, as, as we discuss at some length in the report, raise some interesting new ethical questions. To what extent can you rely on your AI to tell you who are the high and low performers? Would you performance manage based on what the AI is telling you? So there are some new boundaries that are being drawn as a result of the deployment of AI uh, in, in, in within QA. I want to come on to some key considerations. Um, and I'm going to divide these up into three buckets, strategy, technology, and people. So when you're thinking about your strategy, how um, to deploy, where to deploy, who to partner with. It's so important to have those clear objectives up, up front, and it's so easy to get caught up in the hype. It's so easy to, to run before you can walk. So you've always got to be really clear-minded. What is it that you're trying to achieve? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And indeed, is AI actually the right way or the best way to solve that problem? It's really important as well to know what the next step could look like or the next step beyond or the through or I think two or three steps ahead and to have a roadmap. Um, there was a precursor to this particular research. Uh, we did last year something called the navigating the technology seascape. And I think some of the principles we talked about last year really also come into play here, which is to really understand the journey or the voyage that you're going on and to try to think as many steps ahead so that you've always got a direction and a plan and you're future proofing your investments. Another core principle of any technology deployment, but particularly with AI, because AI relies on having data and, and using and data and, and, and data flows, open data flows from across the organization, that's where silos can really create a problem, where, uh, where whether it's technology silos or whether it's management silos, when data exists in its individual silo, and it's difficult to share that data or put that data into one place, that's where we're constraining potentially the power of our tools. Um, but actually it can be a reason to come together. It can be a reason to collaborate. And, and our NAI deployment can be a specific reason to bring departments together and encourage departments to collaborate. A specific area of consideration, a strategic consideration would be around guardrails, would be around the right governance. So most organizations already have some data governance uh, policies in place. But when it comes to AI, when it comes to ensuring that um, the AI operates within the right boundaries, it's so important to think about that gov uh, governance and to think about the guardrails. And this could be a whole 
this could be a whole webinar in and of itself. And one thing that I realize is that it's actually the technologists, it's the technology leaders who understand the risks best, but it isn't the technology leaders who are actually accountable and ultimately will be responsible for implementing these guardrails. So it's really incumbent if you are a business leader, if you're an operational leader, to, uh, to, to, to educate yourself and to become at least as knowledgeable as you need to be on and, and have the right people and resources around you to, to know what, I sh what you should be thinking about when it comes to implementing those guardrails to ultimately protect your customer and to protect your organization. The headlines have been full of examples of what happens when there haven't been the right guardrails and the AI is, is left to do its own thing. And obviously, that's the sort of PR that we can all do without. So here's a quote from the researcher. People want to try to fit AI into a use case because it's hot and it's considered innovative rather than thinking about the problems they want to solve. Is it AI or something else that will actually do the job? What are the key considerations when it comes to people? As with any technology implementation, you've got to bring colleagues on every step and indeed your frontline colleagues in the contact center who know the customers and know the queries and the sentiments and the intents better than anybody else are a great resource to tap into during any build, during any implementation. But there's an extra resonance of bringing your colleagues on the voyage when it comes to AI, because naturally, some, if not many colleagues, may have some concerns. Uh, if you think about the general tone of the public, the wider public debate and discourse when it comes to AI, it's fair to say that the average person and your colleagues will be no exception will be more aware of the risks or be thinking more about AI threats than AI benefits. Will it take my job or will it make my job less interesting? That need for reassurance is so important uh, when deploying either it, it could be front of house AI, it could be customer facing AI, it could be back of office AI. The need for reassurance is absolutely key. And be prepared and expect that roles will change. And this is where the value of a roadmap um, is in, is crucial. It might not happen right away. It might not happen in the next year or even in the next three years. But ultimately, if you go on the journey and if your ambition extends that far, roles will change within the contact center. Generative AI promises an absolute step change because now potentially the advisors on the front line will not need to actually generate the responses. The AI will do that for them. The role of the front line will not be actually to create the responses, but will be to evaluate whether or not this response is the right one for the customer. And the clever way to do it is to actually start seeding and showing and demonstrating the technology to our colleagues so that um, firstly, we can reassure them, they can see the power of the technology. And actually we start to generate some pull, we start to generate some demand when people see how it will make their jobs better and will make their lives and their customer lives better we can start to encourage some pull and some demand for the technology from within our colleague cohort. And ultimately new career pathways will, will emerge as a result of this. Not only will roles and skills change throughout the contact center, but new jobs, new roles will emerge. So I heard from a number of brands who talked about new roles, which might be described as chatbot technicians or bot managers who are high performing frontline advisors who have become bot managers, because essentially what they're doing is cloning themselves. If you take a really high performing person and then you put all of their knowledge and you put all of their expertise into the chatbot. Um, and also make sure that that chatbot is um, is trained and is nurtured as you would train and nurture a colleague. That creates a really interesting new opportunity for somebody who's who's grown up through, uh, perhaps on the phones or or facing customers, but now actually has the opportunity, if you like, to spread and clone their expertise within the AI. When it comes to technology, here are some of the considerations. Um, it is imperative, of course, that there is integration across the tech estate, and this is where the most organizations, particularly legacy organizations who are operating on legacy tech, come in, face barriers. The lack of integration can be the blocker for you to get to the next level. But in the same way that uh, deployment of AI can uh, encourage departments, perhaps who have operated individually, to collaborate more, this can be perhaps the big ticket decision 
that finally gets you to the integration that has been overdue for so long. The big decision that perhaps has been put off for so long might actually now be in the picture if you're looking to deploy AI, because no, there's no doubt that that integration needs to be there. And I've talked a little bit about data governance. We need to think very clearly about where the data is coming from and where to house the data. And that includes data both within and without the contact center. Really important to know the limitations, what the technology can and can't do. A number of folks that I talk to called out still today, as good as the technology is becoming, one of the consistent limitations that I have heard within the contact center is the ability for uh, the analytics to understand context. So what is actually the context behind the query? So when you're doing sentiment analysis, we still got to be aware that there are some limitations and there is still very much a role for humans, particularly when it comes to really understanding context, when it comes to understanding nuance that sits behind language. And there's a whole set of considerations around choosing a large language model if you're, if you're looking to, to put generative AI in place, which I discussed at some length in the report. It's really important to think about how you nurture your AI, just as you wouldn't hire a human advisor or a human colleague and just put them in the corner without any training or coaching. You've got to expect to be able to train and coach your, your AI capability on an ongoing basis, exactly as you would a human and very quickly, just to um, cover off some of the things when you're looking to pick partners, when you're looking to select from the myriad of brands and providers that are out there, some of the decisions that you'll inevitably need to make. Do I work with a single vendor, vendor and benefit from ease of implementation or do I pick best of breed when it comes and, and pick and select the best tools? These are all considerations, pros and cons that I've discussed at length in the report. Can I leverage my existing relationships? Most CCAS providers now have an AI capability and should I just take that off the shelf AI capability or should I bring in my own? What is their track record? What is their track record within my specific vertical industry within the UK? Do they have the right values? Does their team share the same outlook on um, where AI, AI is going? What is the strength of the, the customer success team? Are they able to help us help me solve problems? Are they offering me a tailored pilot? Are they offering me a proof of concept? Uh, is the demo tailored to my specific customer requirements and my specific customer journeys and my use case? And then finally, last but absolutely not least, there, as with any technology implementation, can be value in working with a third party, particularly when it comes to AI, because it is so new to many of us, and it already is such a crowded marketplace, the value of working with a third party, a systems integrator, a consultancy is they can help you navigate, as well as, of course, providing resource to actually build and implement. That was a really quick whistle stop tour through the contents of the report. And I would absolutely uh, invite everybody to dial, uh, dial in to, uh, to download the report, which is a free download from ccma.org.uk. At this point, I would like to invite Nick, Ben, and Dan to the stage to, to talk with me about some of the themes that I've just been discussing. Welcome to the stage. I can see some questions are coming in as well. So just a reminder to everybody in the audience, if you've got any questions for me, for Dan, for Nick, uh, or for Ben, do make use of the Q&A function. So Nick, I think you're still, I can't, can't quite see you yet. And everybody is on mute still. So it might be that we need to unmute you. Oh, there we go. Welcome, to, welcome one and all. So quick round of introductions and uh, let's start with you, Ben. So Route 101, this is our second collaboration. Uh, uh, thank you so much for supporting us and welcome to the panel, Ben. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Would you like to say a little bit about what you do at Route 101? Uh, yeah, so um, my name is Ben Smith. I am a technical solutions consultant at uh, Route 101. I work in our solutions um, engineering team. Um, for those on the call that maybe aren't aware who Route 101 are, um, we are a contact centre customer experience focused uh, organisation. We help organisations sort of uh, implement new technologies or uh, achieve sort of uh, strategic goals, if you like, through the um, installation of uh, technologies. Great to have you, Ben. Dan, hello again. 
Hello, yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Cotton, and I'm head of innovation um, at Simply Business. Um, if you don't know who we are, we're a digital first insurance broker that offers business and landlord insurance to SMEs across the UK and the US. Glad to be here. Glad to have you, Dan. And uh, I think Nick, we hopefully should have Nick back online very, very shortly. But let's let's kick off and hopefully Nick can join us in just a bit and we'll um, ask Nick to intro uh, when he comes online. So I'm just going to kick off with, with a question of my own, which sort of echoes some of the talking points and themes that I just shared. And my, my question for everybody in the panel is, how can you know if AI is right for you? How do you how do you choose your your own use cases and decide which ones to invest in and prioritize? Dan, maybe I'll I'll pick, uh, I'll ask you to take that one in the first instance. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really really good question, um, and because it's such a broad landscape. I mean, you talked to some of those elements in in the research, sure, and I think it's quite a daunting question uh, when it comes to where does AI actually fit. In the business um, and for us actually we took the decision to get on the journey quite quickly to learn first and foremost about you know where this fits start quite small couple of use cases see sort of where you go and i think effectively for us being a regulated organization it allowed us to effectively work uh, in a controlled and low risk manner and um, help us understand a little bit more about you know, the true potential of AI and those use cases within the business, but also to understand sort of any limitations that that come with the technology, because it is so vast. And every day, it seems someone's offering something different. So I think for us, it was about sort of getting on that journey and, and you know, opening those channels of learning. And what were some examples of those entry level use cases that you decided to go with in the first instance? So for us, the ambition was around customer self-service. I mean, our core business model is around a sort of online quote and buy experience. But actually, our post-sale experience was relatively limited when it came to customer self-service. Um, so for us, it was about taking away those real sort of high volume, sort of low complexity examples um, from our sort of frontline consultants. And it was things as simple as, I need my doc policy documents, you know, sounds as simple as it is. Um, you know, prior to prior to that, we didn't have self-service capabilities that allowed customers to to self-serve on that basis. Um, and there was other things like we'll, you know, offer incentives to customers and they'd be just chasing up to understand where that's coming from and where, you know, where in the status it is, when am I going to receive this incentive? Um, and they were occupying a lot of time from our advisors and, you know, they'd be the first to say, this isn't the best use of my time. I like having, you know, engaging conversations with customers that need my help. Um, so we started there and we were, we were led by the, the, you know, the consultant team on this really about, you know, what do you want us to take out and, you know, what do you think could be self-served on? So they're just a couple, um, but that's where we started quite, quite small. Thanks so much, Dan. Nick, hello. I'm going to ask you that question, but first of all, would you like to introduce yourself, Nick? Uh, sorry, I uh, clearly had a camera malfunction. Um, hi, good to see everyone. Uh, Nick Coleman uh, from Dunelm. Uh, so I lead a team uh, focused around customer experience and related technology. So I guess everything uh, outside of operating a contact center, um, I'll leave that to my esteemed colleagues. Um, Great to have you, Nick. And the question is, how do you know if AI is right for your organization? Uh, I think it's a question that everybody needs to ask themselves to start with. Um, and I think if you particularly kind of pivot to the contact center use case, you've, you've got to be looking at yourselves. You've got to be holding the mirror up to yourself and, and how you're operating and what you're doing. Um, so some of the kind of examples that you know, kind of processes we've gone through is really trying to understand where your efficiencies are. Um, so where are you spending human effort, particularly at scale? Um, and think about if that effort could be spent differently. Um, AI is an obvious kind of use case in, in a lot of those spaces. Um, and, then, and then probably something that maybe we didn't anticipate so early on was thinking about where AI could help you accelerate some capabilities that 
you previously thought were far away. So for us, that's, you know, thinking about personalization and how do we bring a more personalized service at scale into play. Um, whereas if you'd have asked me that, you know, probably even six months ago, I think, you know, we were so far away from even considering that given the scale we're operating at and given the maturity level that we were at, but it's opened our eyes and opened our doors to saying, well, actually it's not that hard to bring in elements of it. There's clearly a journey to go on. Um, but elements of personalization at scale, utilizing AI or leveraging AI capability can be achieved. Um, so why not why not kind of walk with it? Thanks, Nick. And from our conversations before, I know that Danil, it's fair to say, isn't a, necessarily an early AI adopter. And yet it was a conscious decision that you made to not be an earlier adopter, to be very intentional and very thoughtful about, about when to adopt. And it's okay to follow. And I think it's fair to say a lot of people feel the pressure to be an early adopter because they feel like they'll be left behind. Um, do you th do you think that um, everybody needs, to, do you think there are natural benefits to being an early adopter? Can it actually be better to be a follower? Uh, I think like, well, to, to kind of um, take your point on a little bit, like what what is your business culturally? So our business culturally is more of a follower than a leader that kind of serves us quite well in terms of being more considered when we're taking you know decisions and we're and we're quite i guess risk averse uh to that point um but on the other hand i would say that this space has moved so fast and will continue to move so fast that you do need to develop a point of view even if you're not necessarily saying i'm going to act on that yet um so, so developing a point of view is key, but also taking your time and not feeling rushed, right? So really evaluating those, you know, those potential use cases. Don't feel like you have to solve them all at once with the same kind of technology, right? B different things for, for different purposes. Um, but, but taking a measured approach where it makes sense to move, why not? Um, but yeah, probably, yeah, for, for us, that's been very reflective of, of our kind of overall kind of positioning and, and culture as a business anyway. And the point of view does, isn't necessarily the same as adoption. The point of view could be, mm -hmm. it's, it, we're not ready yet to adopt. Um, but for me, that point really lands. And I think another reason why it lands for me is because our staff are going to be asking us, what's our strategy? What's our plan? I read all about this new technology that's coming in. Are we going to adopt it? And we need to be ready as leaders to answer that question. Ben, let's turn to you. You, you work with a lot of different organizations um, in your role as Route 101. How do you help them ascertain where to begin and sort of what the voyage looks like? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good question. And I think not to um, not to sort of oversimplify this, but we really want to start with understanding what that sort of customer journey is and the sort of entire sort of life cycle, right? So, so why is it that people are getting in contact um, with our with our with our contact centre, the function that it has, um, and we can sort of start mapping things out, right? Because there's AI is such a broad term. There are solutions that could fit various sort of points along this sort of timeline. So if we just to sort of expand on that a little bit, if we're talking about maybe something proactive, so we've noticed there's an issue and the internet's gone down, we can engage proactively using sort of conversational AI. We're, we're addressing this sort of part up, up, upstream, um, moving into sort of those contacts coming in. How are they coming in? What channels are, are coming in? What is it that people are getting in contact for? To Dan's point around sort of um, high volume, low value, those are sort of things we want to sort of automate because that's what the customers are after, right? This is, you know, I, I term it the generation of instant gratification. We want something now. You want something, you want to buy something online, it turns up tomorrow. You want answers and such. So, you know, where where AI is so broad, it's really sort of understanding the whole sort of journey for, for a customer, but also when we get into the center, you know, the agent experience as well. So the research touches on things like agent assist. Um, how can we support agents reduce, you know, reduce the cognitive load for those guys, maybe um, 
things like speed to competency, getting new starters up quicker. So using sort of some sort of co-pilot types sort of solutions in that sense. So um, it's a it's a great question. It's a broad answer. I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but it really does start with understanding sort of that entire sort of timeline um, and and also what the what the plans are of the of the business that we're that, that we're working with. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, uh, how far ahead can you can you can you genuinely plan, Ben? Given how fast the technology is moving, is is it possible to plan for even a three year, five or even a five year horizon, or is it more about is it more you know what, how far is the horizon for you typically? Um, yeah, the the scale, you know, the speed of evolution of the technology at the moment is 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 something that is quite awesome, quite frankly. The stuff the stuff that's coming in. Um, it's it's sort of related it's sort of per, per sort of case really so you know we're looking to address something sort of now based on the, the way that customers are wanting to interact and what they're trying to do but also sort of you know, sort of to mirror that to the asian sort of you know any sort of asian sort of um focus that we need to be that we need to be um, cognizant of um how far is 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 a very good question and a very difficult one to 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 answer um but it does sort of link to the point around, you know, these these solutions and these and these projects ultimately, right? They, they you know should really be viewed as an iterative process, an iterative journey. So we you know we can start, we can see some value, we can prove some value, and then we can start to sort of build out the use cases um, as the capabilities or integrations, the data becomes available, or something that we can use. Um, <clears throat> so it's yeah, we can sort of it's 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 an ongoing. Um, ever-evolving piece. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to bring in an audience question here because it feels quite relevant to this particular conversation that we're having right now. And then, Dan, I'm going to ask you to take with the, in this one in the first instance. So we've got a really interesting question from somebody who's obviously not yet on the journey but is trying to go on the journey but is experiencing perhaps some resistance from top management. So the question is, I'm a keener user of tools that improve the customer experience. Um, the issues for me are multiple languages, which has complexity, but also the exec team are not huge fans of AI as the personal approach is what they believe is the key differentiator. The contact center seems to be the best place to start. How can I generate confidence in the exec team that the customers will have a better experience? And I don't know whether you've got some relevant ideas here, Dan, as somebody obviously who's recently gone through that journey of moving from a human 100% human assisted to some self-serve, some AI um, assistance. How do you convince skeptical managers that AI isn't going to detract from the customer then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really common challenge, if I'm honest. And it was certainly one that I faced um, this sort of this last sort of iteration. Um but one of the things that we typically do as a business, um, and certainly within the operations team, is a lot of our business cases are based on a number of assumptions, right? There will be some, you know, ex external market insight. The reality of the situation is we need to prove that this is going to 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 work. And whether that's from a, you know, from an, a, an efficiencies perspective, if that's what the business case is based on, or whether that's, you know, improvement or maintenance of, you know, customer experience. Um, so for us, our common use of being able to do that is is via proof of concept um, and it's getting the buy-in at that point uh, for a short period of time whether that be you know for a month three months or even six to be honest depending on 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 the use case but i think it's the natural stepping stone for let's not over invest let's not over commit let's get some learning let's drive up the confidence of the value case you're putting together um, and that's always served us pretty well. Um, and to be honest with you, it, it's given us, you know, I've had mixed successes really. So, so where business cases have come across super strong and you think, you know what, it's a no brainer. We do it. The proof of concept actually, in some cases does devalue it a little bit and changes your direction mm -hmm. right through to ones where, you know, we've hit the ground running and it's, you know, we've, we, we've moved into to sort of full, full, full implementation, yeah. you know, within a, a few weeks in. So I think, I think that's, if you're trying to achieve buy-in, I think that's the place to start. I think you need to be clear on, you know, what problems you're looking to solve and, and hopefully that's sort of contained within the, 
you know the business case you're putting together um but i think it is start small prove the value um and then you can you know you can build confidence in that and 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 and, and whoever else at senior leadership level um and yeah that's always served well for us I imagine the proof of concept isn't just about buying for the management; it's also buying for the front line and buying on the at the ground level, as well. But very much so, yeah. I think it, it's such a broad spectrum. You're looking at, you know, the strategy of what you're trying to achieve. You know, how is it going to impact our people? You know, how does it impact our customers? There, there's so many considerations, and I think there's always an element of risk um, with with a lot of this stuff. So for me, it's about you know, finding ways to mitigate, gain the learning, drive up the confidence um, and, and give you probably a bit of a bit of a runway to to, to go at yeah. um, and, and, and to, to make that decision on, on, on you know, on, on a good level. Nick, perhaps I could come to you with the same question. To what extent, Nick, does buy in? Do you have to? Is it a consideration whether it's management buy in or colleague buy in? Is it something that um, that you have to work with or, or generate? Um, I would say to a point, but I think it's to a point because the, the things that I referenced earlier in terms of taking the time to understand where the opportunities are and really focusing on what your problem is, like Dan talks about it there, right? What, what are your objectives? What are the goals and what are the measures that you're ultimately trying to achieve? Because if you're not doing that up front, you're not pinpointing use cases. It's really easy to say, right, oh, we'll just implement AI. Where, where do you start? To Ben's point earlier, right? There's so many different opportunities to, um, and pitfalls actually to, uh, you know, to to potentially doing that. So I think you've got to be really focused in the, in, in the beginning, certainly if you're starting out on a journey where it's um, either unknown for you or it's not sponsored or it's not well thought of, um, really focusing on yeah what that core objective is what problem is it that you're looking to solve and then layering on the fact that ai could be a solution to it but it's probably one of many solutions to these problems and um, it shouldn't just be seen i think there's a danger of that it's seen as the default solution to everything yeah. it's not at all um you know automation uh, robotics, you know, all of these things, even AI in in a in very different forms to what we kind of like know it as in the past 12 months or so have been around for so long and we've been using them for a long time. All of these things don't suddenly not matter anymore or or not or, or they're not for fit for purpose. They're absolutely fit for purpose. Most of them possibly will do a bigger um more consistent job for us without the risk. Um, so, so yeah, I think for me, it's about focusing on what are you trying to achieve? Thank you very much. I'm gonna bring in a different question um, and I'll direct this one to you, Ben, if I may. I've got a good question from Tony. Tony's interested in how AI can reduce agent effort. Um, ben, you talked about cognitive load. How can AI be deployed to reduce cognitive load on the front line and therefore reserve more cognitive load to, to focus on the customer. Do you have any examples um, of where that can happen? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, uh, a few, to be honest. So uh, maybe the other sort of try and just sort of work through these mentions. So um, things like uh, maybe some, some AIs or something to do some kind of capture upstream of that contact, right? So we can sort of just reduce that sort of you know, typical example, ID and B. 30, 38, 45 seconds average time. So, you know, we know we can start that call at a certain point. Um, the other, just to talk to some of the sort of poll answers that were there, so sort of agent assistance. So um, technologies available now that will sort of offer real-time interaction guidance and we can have sort of um, sentiment detection and we can have um, AI assisting agents to say that, you know, we think this is... Um, this is a customer risk of churn or this is a vulnerable customer maybe suggest these next steps this is the sort of advice that we would that we would um that we would offer um there's also around some of the uh it was another one writing assist so you know actually just having you know generative ai sort of you know take a few minutes expand this out for me tone shift make it more friendly more formal 
Um, but also post-interaction as well. So um, one of the sort of, um, sort of fairly hot topics is is around sort of auto-summarization of, of contact and, and, and interaction. So um, very easy sort of case to build, you know, sort of how long does that sort of wrap up time, that note-taking sort of typically take, how many agents, how many calls. Um, the secondary to that is also uh, AI having that, in that auto summary sort of example I've just sort of spoken to is actually having a, a unified way of of, of summarizing being being collected right because I think if if um, yeah, agents will will update their notes differently um, and if we took a you know a set of data you know, five hundred thousand there'd be multiple different ways in how that's sort of being populated so. So that's a sort of a secondary sort of benefit to, to, to that sort of technology, that sort of AI um, assisting um, agents. Thanks, Luke. I'm just, uh, ben, I just want to stay with you. I've got a, a question here from um, Ryan, uh, which is, which LLM is the best fit when it comes to agent assist? Would you have a view on that, Ben? <laughs> um, there's... there's LLMs based on sort of industry, uh, so it's again it would be sort of use case specific, um, really. Um, there are enormous data sets trained on sort of CX, you know, CX focused uh, models, and then subsets of that as well. So apologies if it's not a definitive um, answer, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, options. It's. It, it, I think it's impossible, isn't it, to come up with a definitive answer, uh, particularly as the answer today might be different next week. The the LLM landscape is, is evolving that that quickly. Um, got another question, um, which I'll open up to the to, to the panel to anybody who might want to tackle it. Um, do you have experience of using AI? Excuse me to create internal facing knowledge content for your knowledge base. So we talked about using AI as an agent assist writing aid. What about using AI to create internal knowledge base content? Has anybody come across that as a use case or has looked at that as a use case? So we we do, and, and I'll say in part, so I will caveat it, you know, not to the to the to the full scale, but we do have AI helping for some of our sort of quite complex product queries. So we have a team specifically uh, for sales and service support, which are sort of internal facing only and not customer facing. And effectively that team manage our internal knowledge base. Um, and it's there, you know, effectively covering really common product related questions right through to, you know, really complex um, customer requirements. Um, and we have a knowledge management system that our frontline agents can self-serve on. Now, it isn't that there's some proactivity there, but it's predominantly reactive. So it's not necessarily, you know, next, next best action like as it stands today. Um, but we went through the process um, with the vendor that we was using that they, they bought in the generative aspect and we completely, um, we completely changed all of our articles. Um, and we applied a different tone to them. Uh, we condensed them quite a lot. Um, but the importance obviously was not to lose the important part. So there was a journey there um, that we had to go on. But we did we did have quite good success in in, in doing that. Um, because fundamentally, that knowledge, if you know, if your your agents are, you know, speaking to the customer at the same time, quite often, whether that be, you know, over the phone or whether it be on another channel, it needs to be quick, sharp and concise and to the point, but without losing, um, you know, its strength in, 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 in what it's trying to get across. So probably to not see your, your question in, in full, but, um, but yeah, to, to an extent, we've, we, we've looked at some of that. Thanks so much, Dan. Dan, I want to stay with you with a question of my own. Um, so many technologies out there evolving at such a rapid pace, so many providers of technologies out there. How do you navigate through that to, to decide which ones are the right ones for you? What are some of the things that have worked for you when it comes to technology and partner selection? Yeah, and I, th I think, I think you know, you've, you've touched on this already, um, and I think a few of the other guys have as well. It's such a crowded space at the moment. Um, 
And I think you have to be quite, I think you have to be quite intentional with the type of partner that you you want to work with on this. And and I think, you know, Ben said it and, you know, on a couple of occasions, there's there's sort of industry specific stuff and there may be some, you know, preferred partners down that route. Um, some might be sort of more values driven. Um, I, I think I think for us, it was fi about finding the right partner that understood exactly what we wanted to achieve from from day one. But also were effectively culturally aligned with with us and shared the same values because I think when it comes to customer success, you're getting off to a really good uh, starting point of the relationship if that is you know really clear and and aligned. Um, I touched on it a bit earlier in terms of getting to that point. I mean, we we did go via the consultancy route, so that that really helped us. Um, and we also went on the proof of concept route as well. So, um, you know, it was amalgamation of those things. Um, but I think, I, I really do believe you, you can learn a lot from a supplier around someone that offers a proof of concept because I think what they're believing in is not only do they understand your use case, they're standing behind the product to say, we believe it's going to work. Um, and, you know, on a proof of concept, you know, they're as invested as you. In, in doing that um and you know for, for this particular use case you know it's paying its dividends significantly so i think there's a lot to be said and i think it helps to cut through the sales pitch we know we've all we've all heard the sales pitches right um but i think getting get, get, getting truly hands-on with with the product getting that learning feeling like you're in a partnership i think is really important Thanks. Nick, how do you cut through the, the technology, see Gabe and the, the vendor clutter, if you like, uh, and figure out what really works for you? Yeah, so I think for me, it's been about looking at how we leverage the vendor relationships we already have. Um, and and also, how can you how can you try to truly create a partnership? Um with those vendors so you know can you can you have can you get them to have some skin in the game commercially i mean right so some of some of this if you're operating at scale won't be cheap um but you would hope that it's got the roi now are, are they going to commercially kind of put some skin in the game to to prove that to help you prove that out um and now that you know can take some doing and depending on who you're working with might be more successful than others um so so yeah for, for us that was very much about you know understanding what our current um supplier base had to offer did that match with some of the capabilities that we were looking to solve problems around um and and to support the start of our journey the answer was yes now will will we reach the end of the road um, you know, on on that, then quite possibly, but that will depend how quickly we go. Some of the problems we're trying to solve. Um, do we look to internalize some of that capability as well? Is a is a is a question that we uh, you know that we need to walk through. So yeah, I think overall it's about looking how can you leverage what you've got, um, and and trying to dance point to to create a level of partnership that's mutual. Thanks, Nick. I'm going to take a question from Dave uh, and direct this one to you, Ben, if I may. So Dave wants to flag some concerns when it comes to using AI in an agent assist or an agent facing a frontline facing context. So uh, the potential for AI to provide granular insights that might lead management to put additional pressure on agents and potentially increasing attrition rates. The a uh, digital divide and a level of skill required at the agent level to effectively use AI tools. Do you agree with those potential concerns, Ben? And are there ways to mitigate them? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a great point. And there's um, sort of related to that, there is a sort of a certain risk that we take so much easy stuff out we only leave the really hard stuff that actually you know, there's a there's a risk of of sort of overbearing right? um now with regard to agent assist technologies it sort of links to he's in the report around sort of involvement of, of, of people and staff in in the process of this sort of journey now um there's 
to get too sort of um, sort of specific on on on, on this piece, but the, you know, things like competitions, what what are we going to call the new etc. Right. So just getting that involvement piece from 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 staff um, upstream, explaining um, that solutions are here to support, not necessarily you know not here to replace. This is to support um, agents with. Um, and it, ultimately, these should be making agents' lives easier. So if they're, you know, being open to feedback, where things are working, where they're not working, what changes can we can we implement to sort of support any challenges that may have been found in the initial, to sort of talk to this sort of iterative point, right? We don't just turn things on and walk away. We want to make sure that these things are being implemented and, and, and successfully used. So being open to feedback, um, so ultimately, they sh solutions are designed to to reduce that sort of um, stress, that effort for, for for agents. But if it's not working, then maybe we need to you know we need to adjust course a little bit. Thanks, Ben. Uh, just got time for one more question, which I'll send your way, Dan, if I may. Um, in previous roles, I've worked for large organisations with up to four million customers. I can see the wider benefit of investments. But now I operate in a much smaller environment of around 8,000 customers. And I wonder if the value it gives gives back outweighs any cost of implementation. And then I imagine Simply Business, you're not a small business, but you're probably closer to the 8,000 customers than the 4 million customers. As a comparatively smaller business, how do you ensure that the cost benefit equation is right? I, th I think, I mean, you know, I think there's varied levels of ROI depending on use case. And I think it, it again comes back to what are you trying to to achieve if it's efficiency then clearly there's a cost benefit analysis that goes with that if it's if it's if it's driving revenue um that's that's another thing um and th i think there's various levels of scale that you can you know if you do go on the ai journey you don't necessarily have to direct it at everything you know the rest of the panel has kind of talked about that as well but I think it's picking the ones that that make sense for you, and I think depend there there is a there is a point of you know where there may you know it may not make sense financially, and actually it's better having people serving. But I think it it really does depend on again coming back to that what what are you looking to achieve here? Um, and clearly efficiency will scale. Um, and if you are at that sort of level where it, where it's there, but I think it, it can be directed in, in in many many of areas, and 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 actually it may you know augmentation of your frontline staff may be a better fit, um, but it's so it's so broad, and it and and I'm probably not giving you a direct answer on that, but I think it, it, there's there's so many things to consider as to whether you could you could get to a positive ROI or, or not, and I think it really does depend on 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 where where you're focusing it. Yeah, but for me, I think the answer is there probably is an ROI story to be had. Uh, it may not be the same as someone else's ROI story, but there probably is one yeah. out there for you. That is all the time that we've got. Uh, I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question. Thank you to everybody for, for such great questions. Uh, just a reminder that uh, the Navigating the AI Seascape uh, research report is going live very shortly. It's a free download from ccma.org. UK. I would like to thank our panel. Uh, that's Nick Coleman from Donnell, Dan Cotton from Simply Business, Ben Smith from Route 101. I would like to thank Route 101 for once again supporting us on this latest piece of research. Most of all, I'd like to thank all of you, whether you've dialed in live or on the catch up. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and good luck on your own AI voyage. See you on the next one. Take care.